We are rolling. Hi, this is Chris. Hi, this is Kevin. And we're here to chat at you about stuff that we've been talking about for two weeks that we forgot it all and we should have remembered it all and just put it on podcast, but that's going to be a true. I mean, this whole entire thing's already 10 years of stuff. We should have just put on podcast and then we wouldn't have to redo it. You know how we roll by now. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's seriously almost every other day or every time we talk on the phone, we should have recorded that one. Well, we, we start saying, well, what's the subject we should talk about? And instead we just start talking for an hour and then we stop and go, well, that, that should have just been the podcast, <laughs> but uh, maybe we can uh, pull that off right now if we're not too up in our heads about it. So we'll just jump off some of the videos that were salient to us. I like that, that, that word salient. It's something John Ravakey brings up. The concept of salient is, well, the way he talks about it, he says it's important because it's, it's what catches your attention. And there's something about you. There's something about your identity that makes stuff catch your attention. And that's what, that's what salience is. Mm -hmm. And he brings that up a lot in, in the whole entire meaning crisis thing, even how religions catch people's attentions or even how a podcast or a person catches your attention. And, and you can say, well, I'm just a guy who's taking stuff in and all that or whatever, but there's something about me of what's salient to me. that's going to be a little bit different and interesting than what's salient to Kevin. I'm usually running this stuff and we're going through it and I'm putting stuff in front of Kevin, although he's seen it too. But Kevin's got a whole different world of, of stuff that he likes to to get into and go down into that that we haven't quite tapped into yet. But maybe we'll we'll get there uh, one day, get into that the the actual religious imagery. And mm -hmm. I like listening to it too and talking about it and thinking about it and thinking about how it pertains to today. You go a lot deeper with that stuff than I do. I always pull it out into more of a uh, what recent people have been talking about in different philosophy videos or youtube videos and some of them are religious but you you really like to dig into like what the actual scripture says and then maybe we'll get get some of that out yeah we'll see i was ahead. talking to chris so you have to forgive me for my my add that i've always had i guess but i i tend to i tend to float with stream of consciousness quite a bit so it's funny because sometimes i'll go after after we have a conversation and go back and like, oh crap, I didn't hear Chris completely say it. And I, I totally will go off on a tangent. So, you know, that but that's, that's important too. I mean, that's why yeah. you're batting stuff off somebody that, that goes right in line with the concept of salience. If something right. I said didn't nab you right at that moment, right. but I've had that same thing happen too, where I talked on something and I didn't realize somebody said something that was a good point and, and I, yeah, it sailed past me and, or I didn't notice it or hear it. And. And I would have liked to have gone off into it, but that's the, uh, that's the ghost of doing the podcast too. Cause yeah. like what's salient to you in the moment is part of what's important, you know, for sure. Unless you just didn't hear it because of a, of a volume issue, which is, we also have those problems. Yeah. Sometimes too. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start with this one, even though it might not tie in. You're on regular speed. Cause <laughs> we all, we all know how you like to double speed it go on double speed. Unusual to be a conservative. <clears throat> But it is unusual to be an intellectual conservative. In both Britain and America, some 70% of academics identify themselves as on the left, while the surrounding culture is increasingly hostile to traditional values or to any claim that might be made for the high achievements of Western civilization. The press, the bureaucracy, the universities, all hostile to conservatism. Why? It's a very good question. Uh, I think I, I spent my life trying to answer it, in fact. Uh, my impression is that this hostility comes in part because people who self-identify as intellectuals and thinkers also want to identify themselves as in some way outside the community, standing in judgment on it, gifted with superior insight and intellect. Uh, and therefore I inevitably critical of whatever whatever it is that ordinary people do by way of surviving you know uh, and so, so we have created an intellectual class which which by its nature does not identify with the way of life around it uh, and uh, and tries to gain another kind of identity through its critical stance and 
That's uh, Roger Scruton, mm -hmm. the best around. He just recently passed away. He's got a lot of different good ideas about being conservative and intellectual or being conservative and artistic. And I think one of the uh, concepts of this whole channel is us trying to give voice and words in the Mormon and ex-Mormon community to, to some of these uh, possibilities of being artistic or able to uh, articulate things from a conservative standpoint because there's a lacking of it, but it's not because it isn't intelligent nor artistic. It's for sure lacking in the ex-Mormon community. But inside of the Mormon community, Kevin and I have been very critical of this our whole entire lives too. Back when I was fully in, Kevin the whole entire time all the way down, we both always said that maybe the uh, LDS church always should have, I mean, we, we push on that they should keep up with the culture and keep up with the artistic parts of them because there are artistic parts of uh, the Mormon culture. But we've always said that we sh there should have been more of an embracing of of the beauty and the art and that sort of thing inside of Mormon is it was always almost so conservative that we were just gonna, we were only going to look at <laughs> scripture and that's it. And, uh, even scripture, we weren't going to be too artistic about that or video killed everything, <laughs> not yeah. just the radio star, you know, it ended up like, it's just interesting how that kind of perpetuated and the technologies have improved, but it seems like it, it's kind of put the kibosh on art on the arts a little bit. Yeah. So, well, and then a little bit why I wanted to start with that one is not just that we're trying to articulate stuff or remind that's kind of our angle, but it also ties back into something. The last podcast we described it as there's 12 clowns on a stage and a, and a 13th clown gets up there and starts trying to describe things. All we see are 13 clowns and, and it's the exact same thing he's talking about there. Like there's this level of the critical world or the critically conscious world that they think they stand outside of things. They think they stand outside of their physicality. They think they stand outside of, of the whole entire political process. They think they stand outside of everything. And as Kevin and I are fully hyper aware of being inside of, uh, the culture and, and trying to deal with it from the inside or being inside our bodies and trying to deal with the world being uh being meat bodies and mm -hmm. not as people who uh, get to pretend like we're outside of the whole concept and standing in critique of everything else so go right into the michael fallon or a part of it too is kevin keep want and i kind of keep wanting to show some of the different people we listen to i listen mm -hmm. to roger scrute and my bike to read his books the, uh, uh, he's canceled the most it's so funny we're living in a world where the most canceled person is a completely conservative, you know, British guy. He's already passed away. <laughs> he, he was on the board of some housing thing in, in England. And, and within six months before he died, he got kicked off of it just because of his general conservative views mm -hmm. is the most ridiculous thing that I ever saw. Me and Chris have always <laughs> been, um, I think what's interesting is well, the whole, the whole idea of conservative versus liberal, like I would think I still look at Chris and even my, even a bit of myself, like I still look at Chris as being very much classically, cla classically a liberal. And I, yeah, I say that in, in the real sense and it, yeah, right. It's become a conservative position that, that, uh, liberal democracy, which is the patriarchy, by the way, um, is what, what is trying to be, um, taken down. I just think it's interesting because I would say for myself, <laughs> I feel like I've like really, I mean, Chris and I are both very artistic and we also, we've always kind of thought outside of the box. I was telling my wife about when we were back in high school, just how Chris and I would sit and we met our, our senior year and, and, uh, where we would sit like in your driveway of, of your house till two, three in the morning, just talking philosophically for our age level as seniors in high school <laughs> it was pretty deep. I, so I think both of our personalities kind of lean a little bit more in that liberal direction. Um, I oh, think we were, we were I totally think, rebellious. So many people who leave Mormonism, they were, they even like to brag about how goody goody and perfect they were inside of Mormonism. You know, we and were, you and I were always the rebels, you know what I mean? That's All what I'm saying. Through. That's what I'm saying. When that, I was in Mormonism, I was already liberal, liberal Democrat. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And that now I'm not for other reasons, but well, not that 
type of liberal. Uh, right. What it slipped out from underneath them, being liberal slipped out from yeah. underneath them. Yeah. But the thing about it is, is so many people are are caught, especially conservatives, and this is where conservatives need to take note. You guys actually like liberalism because liberal democracy is what you're used to. It's what you actually really like. But when they hear the the idea liberal, oh, you know, it's them commies, you know, and stuff. That's was, just because that the, for so many years it was used as a pejorative, and the yeah, pejorative was just largely the left. And uh, he, here's one of the funny things is recently. I mean, I was doing a podcast. I don't know if I should uh, spoil it already, but it's probably coming out soon with uh, Jonathan Streeter covering uh, James Lindsay's and Helen Pluckrose's book, uh, Social Injustice. Mm -hmm. And part of the whole first chapter is trying to describe that we're trying to rescue liberalism. And just today, Benjamin Boyce released a video with King Crocoduck. That's a good channel. I should show that channel too some mm -hmm. other time. That was the first time I've heard of, heard of him. He has good videos on Lysenkoism or Lysenkoism mm -hmm. that Flip and I have talked about, which is how politics got so in the way in the Soviet Union that they ended up killing tons of people in the Holodomor because they tried to put politics into their science. And uh, a lot Sounds of... Familiar. Uh, yeah. And uh, a lot of uh, modern-day theory is... is Barging into that beyond just some of the political players too, but the reason I brought it up is because their their whole point of coming together today was kind of like a uh, putting the flag down, saying we're going to stand up for liberalism. And that other book was the full final chapter of it. If you read it, is liberalism was always good enough. We're standing up for it. a small L liberalism, which is mm -hmm. just the general idea, the John Locke and um, John Stuart Mill liberalism. I think Quick Quick uh, always has a good uh, good perspective on that Quick's too. Quick's like, excellent at it. Right? Quick's awesome. He 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 really knows how to how to frame it in the right context and and say it the right way. We just had Martin Luther King's Day. All these uh, modern day activists get mad if uh, people who don't fit their current views mention Martin Luther King in his speech and his concept of of a colorblind liberalism, which mm -hmm. we know perfectly well that you can't be colorblind oh my gosh you're blowing my mind the 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 colorblind liberalism is a concept like a starting point of how to act in the world we just had martin luther king day martin luther king in the civil rights act was was liberalism you could even argue it was like slightly outside of liberalism because there's even some people who like say well that's kind of even putting laws into the book that was more laws than <laughs> were needed that's already there in the constitution the problem is is that it just up to that point, under Jim Crow laws and those other types of uh, things, it hadn't been lived up to of treating all people equally or whatnot. But there's a lot of a uh, thought in that arena. But liberalism, we we are conservatively liberal. I mean, I don't know. Like, <laughs> we're conservative I'm... for liberalism because because what modern day progressivism, what modern day Democratic Party is, is not liberalism. Right. It's progressivism but like with a hard p <laughs> progressive with a hard p it's laws 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 save everything mm -hmm. your rights even come from the law it's, authority, you know? it's becoming authoritarianism your, like, your rights aren't right. inalienable your rights right. aren't from a god which is the way some people put it but even atheists should be able to understand why that concept was put in there Right. That concept was put in there because it's saying that you can't take it away. No, it's not right. coming from you. It's not coming from your laws. It comes from something outside. It comes from something natural. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, just the, the Democratic Party. You you can even claim sometimes the the, the uh, conservative party, especially the time frames when I didn't like it, got like a bit like got authoritarian sometimes in their laws or passed sure. any laws or, or but. The Democratic Party right now, especially in the past four or five years, has has just become the opposite of liberalism. I don't know how else to say it. It's not liberal. You can like it. Go ahead and like it. But you like progressivism if you like it. Yeah. It's the not thing liberal. about it. The thing about it is the conservative side has always been a little uh, authoritarian a bit themselves, and yeah. I think that they're used to it. They they're they're kind of they're tenured in it. Yeah. And now it's like what happened, like 
our 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 little liberal sister all of a sudden turned into like Frankenstein now and, and she's <laughs> out of control. She's completely out of control. Well, and the conservatives. We how do we reel her back in? You know, conservatives used to be very open to to corporatism. They used to think, well, that's just the free market and not really grasping the whole entire concept of crony corporatism, that, mm -hmm. that once those things get embedded with the government and start... Which is essentially crony. really fascism, correct? As Mussolini defined it, yeah. Right. Yeah. It's the marriage. It's the marriage of a corporate and the state. And that's what, that's what we really are living under right now, as much as mm -hmm. people screamed about it come in the past five yep. years. And people... people um, <laughs> I would say people on the left really kind of get uh, confused about the difference between capitalism and corporatism. Yeah, when I'm, they critique capitalism. Yeah, I'm 100% for the independent means of, per, per, uh, of production because that's what I am. I'm a small business owner. I am the independent guy going out and building decks for people. You know what I mean? And... Um, but the thing about it is, is you, you, as we've seen, like, there's really been this hard push. I think this is this. I mean, you, you can go down all the the rabbit holes of like the Great Reset, which you should. Uh, you should be keeping an eye on that kind of thing, even though it's conspiracy theory. It's actually outright <laughs> open. Go read Klaus Schwab's book, The Great Reset. He's coming out with another one too, by the way. But anyway, it, there is a. A major push with co within COVID, we really saw it. This uh, big, um, really, there was a, a major transfer of wealth. Um, the only businesses that were really, really doing really well were the big box and online businesses, Amazon's, uh, and they profited off of draconian oh, laws. And 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 then you see all these, and th think about it. All the all the restaurants you see nowadays are really basically big box chains. You know what I mean? And COVID killed off a lot, especially you go to California and killed off a lot of mom and pop restaurants and here too. Um, I mean, we're more, one of the more conservative states in the union here in Utah, but uh, I think we're kind of teetering a little bit, but, but still like small business has suffered greatly. And that is a direct hit on cap, what capitalism is. Corporatism is, is this Frankenstein of, of government and, and big business, basically kind of funneling things into their pockets and taking it away from the independent guys. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'll get off my rant. No, that's a perfect rant. In fact, your rant's, your rant's going to take place of just even listening to this. I'm just showing him. This is Michael Rechtenwald. He was an NYU professor in postmodernism and these types of... Uh, theories that Kevin and I uh, will wrangle on about and make fun of, but it, it was a really strange thing for people to understand that corporatism isn't the free market. And not only is it not corporatism, I mean, is it not the free market? Corporatism going all the way back a hundred years has, has all sorts of collectivist, major, major collectivist major fascistic ideas inside of it of using the using the state to advance your wealth and to uh, get all the people in line to turn to you for all of your uh, your needs and michael rechtenwald here like i said he was at nyu he was a philosophy professor at there of course he got canceled because he turned against it all but he's he's got a i think a book called woke capitalism maybe another one that's worth worth uh getting into and reading and uh, I mean, I won't play any of this, but Michael Rechtenwald is the guy to, to check out with that stuff and those types of warnings. I, I've got another book by, it. okay. So this is the book woke Inc. Vivek. So I couldn't say his name. Can't say his last name. Ramashami. And that gets, that gets into detail about How all these different movements that we see happening. I just watched this uh, <laughs> some Super Bowl ads today. Not Super Bowl because it wasn't the Super Bowl. All the ads in the NFL have gone from being funny 10, 20 years ago to being woke, and it's all part of this crony corporatism. This is another this is another good book about maybe how you can fight back if you see your place getting corporatized. Mm -hmm. Charles Pincourt. Um, we need to just, instead of calling it woke, we just need to call it Karenism. 
<laughs> I, I really what's happening man it's like everything's going karen there's no freaking comedy anymore you know like yeah, you can't funny. you can't crack a joke man because it's patriarchal you know it's a uh, wrong i'm gonna show you something it's funny. wrong it's wrong think Here, here's a yeah skaga let's see what's on the trending page today Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Finally, the tea can be served. Hi, poor people. Welcome back to my channel. My publicity team has informed me that the best move to save my brand is to make another apology video. So I decided to sit down on my $50,000 Versace couch and pose like an Afghan hound in my multi-million dollar mansion. Yeah, just like any other normal human being would. Yeah. Oh my god. Jeffrey, you are such a royal queen. Spill the tea, sister. All is forgiven. Lady Gaga just came out uh, this week. And, oh, maybe I can find it. But it's all part of the woke corporatism, just like the NFL ads. There's there's nothing rebellious about it. Not nothing. It's all, it's all step in line. It's terrible. They had an interview in Variety. I probably showed those out of the wrong order, but... I don't even know why uh, I thought of these. Patriarchy and capitalism like destroy women all the time. Like, just look how destroyed she is. It ruins yes, us. Yes, yes. A way that I think people don't always see. Give me the tea. And I think we hide it really well. And there's like tools and fashion and and just hair and makeup and all sorts of things that are invented no, so that we can invented. hide our pain. <laughs> She's so oppressed. <laughs> Makeup and hair and stuff is invented by patriarchy <laughs> to hide the pain. And I'm capitalizing off of it every show that I do. <laughs> so I got into this uh, this whole debate on the, it was a little bit of a debate. They tried to claim there's no such thing as neoliberalism, that it's just a slur that you use uh, on anything that you don't like. But that's what neoliberalism is. Neoliberalism is the, the same way neocons, people talked about neocons. Neocon was everything that you thought was some conservative move or some pro-military or pro-war move or poor save the, uh, the Middle Eastern countries move had a corporate underpinning to it and had a corporate reasoning to it. And neoliberalism is just the other side of that, is people putting... And corporate sneakiness will even use a critical race theory term from Derek Bell called interest convergence and he, that this is one of the things about all those different theories is they had some good ideas in them the problem is, is you just couldn't ever say no that doesn't count in this case or no that's false here you, you just it has to be universal at all times but that interest convergence concept of white liberals are only doing it to make money for themselves John DeLynn, um, are, <laughs> they are, there's some truth to it. There's some truth to it when it's true, well, you know, you and, know <laughs> and neoliberalism is the idea that you are just pulling off any sort of different liberal idea. Let, let's, I sniffed out. I was one of the first persons to sniff out. Not that I've, I've been able to sniff out everything ever that rage against the machine was full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> In the 90s, I was like, what? They're not raging against the machine. They are the machine. Yeah. They, they rage on behalf of the machine. You know? <laughs> and the corporatism, pushing all those ideas and pushing all those things, you can also just say, well, maybe it's just about getting some dumb money. That's a little bit of maybe the South Park's angle on it for the past five, six, seven years. But I don't think it's conspiracy or theory at all to say, no. no, it goes deeper than that. Check it out. Here's like the... the greatest argument you hear on the internets these days if you don't like the platform go start your own wrangling and speech and stuff like that and um of course we're gonna get canceled and this video is gonna get shut down in a couple of <laughs> we don't make enough money yet or have enough yeah. viewers yeah. but yeah. they would if we did but yeah. this is somebody kevin and i listened to a whole bunch this is michael o'fallon public occurrences he drops one every day there's been a couple videos of him talking with James Lindsay and Stephen Hicks, and he's been uh, on this and reading about it and putting it out there, kind of in a sense like Quick does in the Mormon community, but from the uh, Southern Baptist, the SBC. And he's been 
ostracized for saying it and being correct about it for years now. And uh, so he talks about the stuff he partially knows about all of it because he was a businessman as well, not just a pastor. High up in, in the travel industry. So he yeah. had a lot of connections in that area. For sure. And the travel industry is getting eaten up just like Lady Gaga the world getting, is getting eaten up, just like the NFL is getting eaten up, just like any corporate company coming near you is getting eaten up by the same concept. Let's just listen to this for a second. The created man-fashioned God that will seek to steal all of the attributes that only the creator and sustainer of the universe himself intrinsically possesses. A God who is all-knowing. An artificial God of man who is all-knowing. The artificial God of man must be omniscient. The new God of man must be all-knowing of all things at all times. The new God of man must know your heart rate at all times, your temperature at all times, your general health condition at all times. The new God of man must know what you're reading at all times, know what you are watching at all times, know what you are saying at all times, know what you are thinking at all times. As a matter of fact, the new artificial god of man will be able to replace your bad thoughts, the thoughts that you should be thinking, with the new thoughts approved by the god created by human hands. The new god must know where you are at all times, because the new god is omnipresent. And the new city of the new omnipresent god is the central city, the gentrificated city the center city that eliminates all suburban living, because the new city of the new God is not a city. It is a panopticon. And what is a panopticon? Well, a panopticon is an institutional building where people are kept under inspection, whether it is a hospital, a school, public housing for poor people, a factory, or a mental health institution. But the most famous application is that of a prison. The essence of the panopticon is that of central inspection. The panopticon is a disciplinary concept brought to life in the form of a central observation tower placed within a circle of prison cells. And from the central tower, a guard can see every cell and inmate, but the inmates can't see into the tower. Prisoners will never know whether or not they are being watched. The new city of the new artificial god is a prison, a panopticon. In fact, the new world of this genderless Marxist god is a prison, an endlessly surveilled city of technology and physical enforcement. But don't worry, the new god of man's making is an omnibenevolent god. The new artificial god is good. And the new all-knowing, all-powerful God is a God that knows what is best for mankind collectively because we are all in this together. We're all in this together. <laughs> what movie is that from? I don't know. That's a, oh, uh, that's, yeah, that's um, a stupid, like, wasn't it? It's a Disney movie, High isn't it? We might get something. dinged for that one worse than anything. Ah, crap. <laughs> <laughs> Oh um, man! Yeah. Because we're in the panopticon. Um, Matrix, the Metatrix. The Matrix. I was thinking about that. It's kind of like the Matrix kind of seemed like it had it backwards because, like, when they're you know they have all the pods, like the tower of the pods, you know, and stuff in the Matrix. Except yeah. for it's like it's supposed to be on inside, like a tower, instead of like on the outside of a tower. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So that's a panopticon. A real one just has a tower in here where the where the uh, and the tower's like blacked out, mm -hmm. so you can't see who the uh, guard is looking at at any times or where the gun is pointed at any time. Yeah. But this uh, meme is making fun of the concept that the observer right here. Here. If you want to go down the uh, the old uh, conspiracy theory rabbit hole, which is just conspiracy reality, I guess, but. Um... When I, when I think about, so the, a lot of people will say, what's the mark of the beast that's talked about in 
in Revelation and stuff. What, what's the mark of the beast? And it say that you, it's, uh, you're going to have this mark in your hand and also in your head. And it's, uh, you know, people are thinking like, oh, is it, is it the vaccine? Is it, is it uh, you know, they want to chip you, they want to implant you with a chip. Listen, you numb nutses, you're carrying a freaking chip around with you all the time. I can't do anything now without done. this stupid phone. You know, I got all my business, my family. I got it. I have this on me all the time. So, in my opinion, the mark of the beast is already here, and you're, you know, you're probably watching, is like you're probably watching us on it right now. Like on the meme right here is the, the eye of Sauron. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Um, I think you're completely right about that. And actually some famous person foretold of our exact mediums, our media becoming the thing that took over our lives and became the thing that formed our thinking and formed everything about us. Mm -hmm. He was a very famous communications, probably the father or godfather, the father of communications by the name of Marshall McLuhan. And I actually studied a lot about him because I have a, a communications undergraduate. It's a phony degree, I know it. Um, the, uh, that's a Simpsons. In there now. Yeah, that's a Simpsons reference. Uh, the at guy it, there, go at ahead. Least it didn't end, at least it didn't end with studies. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a Simpsons reference where this punter, this famous punter like breaks his leg in a football game. And it's a college game. It's like, he was going to go to the NFL. And it's like, it's all right. He can fall back on his degree. He has a degree in communications. Oh, <laughs> it's right. It's a phony degree. <laughs> Here's a famous scene with Marshall McLuhan. A lot of, not a lot of people might have realized this is Marshall McLuhan. It's a famous scene in Woody Allen's Annie Hall. He's standing in line and he's got this blowhard behind him just bla blabbing and blabbing about how fancy movies are it really is annoying it goes on for two minutes i fast forwarded past that and woody's getting annoyed at listening to the uh the guy blab and blab like he's a some sort of smarty pants behind him about about <coughs> theater and television and all that stuff and so he finally confronts him turn of the screw it's the Bisexual. influence of television now marshall McLuhan deals with it in terms of it being a, a high a high intensity, you understand? A hot medium. What I would give for a large sock as with horse manure in it. Which he uses as what do you do when you get stuck or on a movie line with a guy like this behind you? Wait a minute, why it's can't I give my maddening. opinion? This is a free country. He, he, he can give you. Do you yeah. have to give it so loud? I mean, aren't you ashamed to pontificate like that? And, and the funny part of it is, Marshall McLuhan, you don't know anything about Marshall McLuhan's oh, really? work. Really? Really? I happen to teach a class at Columbia called TV, Media, and Culture. So I think that my insights into Mr. McLuhan, well, have a great deal of validity. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, that's funny because I happen to have Mr. McLuhan right here. So, so, yeah, just let me, let me, let me, come over here a second. Oh, Tell I, heard, I heard what you were saying. You, you know nothing of my work. You mean my whole fallacy is wrong. How you ever got to teach a course in anything is totally amazing. Boy, if life were only like this. <laughs> We're all, we are all now dumber after having listened to it. I well, that's kind of funny because the thing that did solve that is the exact thing that became the panopticon, right? The thing that solved, like they're talking about, wow, this guy's just being a bloviating blowhard, but I've got the guy right here right now. But those same types of arguments get ended nowadays because of that same, uh, that same device in our hands. <laughs> that device in our hands is like having Marshall McLuhan real fast to say something. Yep. But Marshall McLuhan had... A lesser known warning about these types of devices and he foresaw he foretold it this is Jonathan Pajau talking with Christian Roy who's uh, he's a little bit difficult to understand this one I for sure recommend listening to in double speed because when somebody's got a foreign accent a French accent and it's a little bit difficult for them to get through sentences if you put it at double speed, the sentences snap together. You can even like read in the comments of this one, a lot of people saying, I couldn't understand, I couldn't understand him, but, but you snap them together. But he is a professor who's gone into the works of Marshall McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan foretold of devices like our devices that would gobble us up. And he, people might not have realized was a, a bit of a Christian, you might call it. And he said that they would be the beast, the, the mark of the beast, the beast that we'll all get swallowed into and that sees us and that does all things like the eye of Sauron. And 
he has some idea. Well, he calls it the Antichrist, the, the nervous system of the Antichrist. And this is the, this is that guy who died way back in the time of Annie Hall, not not much long after that, uh, way before we ever saw any of these devices predicting it. Right. Even in terms of the difference between Christ and Antichrist, everybody thinks that they'll be the one who who can tell the yeah. difference. Uh, but it's it's very different. It's very difficult to know. You know that. The difference between, let's say, uh, an example in scripture, the difference between Judas telling Christ that they should use the money to help the poor and Christ telling us to help the poor. Yeah. And so what is the difference? There is a difference between the two, but I think that it's easy to be seduced by, by, you know, by one or the other. That it's easy to be seduced by the falsification. That's that's not exactly on the topic of the panopticon. That's on the previous topic. It's on the topic of how do you tell when something's real or fake social justice? How do you tell when something is is a sneaky way to ensnare you into a system of stupidity or something is actually the social justice thing? And this is one of these questions that come up all the time. You, you see people try to make the point like they're they're a galaxy brain. And they suddenly say, Jesus Christ was for helping the poor. You know, why don't, why don't Christians understand that? So we should have taxes. We should all be taxed to the living heck out of us. All. In fact, Marxism would be the best answer for that. And that completely misses the concept that is the antichrist to the Christ, you know, uh, it, using that terminology. It's a thing that looks a lot like you might be right. Gee, we got to all do communism to give, so the poor all have the same amount of everything. But that the law of charity is not being taxed at gunpoint by the state to then forcibly and in a cronyistic way mishandle the funds all the way to the point of never maybe actually properly disseminating it across the people it's it's that's the exact concept of you're you think you're getting it and you're not getting it you know you're not getting the idea of yep. uh, what charity actually is or what social justice actually is or what not being racist actually is or what liberalism actually is we're in the time of the antichrist that both gives us this fake upside down almost it thing that's close to the real thing but it's a fake version of the real thing it's not really based off the actual principles that you learn from individually from your heart out it's forced upon you from the outside in and it's all part of a thing that's designed to suck you up into a panopticon. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's it's all taking it into the theology a bit. I think about really the differentiating points are the, are that it's individualism versus collectivism, and it's also the curtailing of agency. I mean, you think about how Christ did things. He was for the individual. Repentance is kind of an individual thing, and the rising tide raises all sh all ships if everybody's doing the right things and stuff like that but christ never forces it there's that picture of christ at the door i stand at the door and knock you know what i mean you got to let him in you, he he's not going to come in he's not going to break the door down or anything like he's not going to force his way in you know it's kind of for the individual to be able to to grasp onto that but the thing about it is is uh this stuff you know we're we're uh we're kind of getting sucked into this thing and it's it's sort of like you're signing on to the record deal and all of a sudden you start realizing it wasn't quite the deal that you expected it to be totally so much of what flip and i go after and kevin like we have the same the same angle the same views on these types of things no matter what religion we're in or not in there, there might be somebody like Flip who, who like I can, I can land on these ideas completely outside of religion and, and realize that there's something worth holding on to here or worth avoiding. And then there's someone like Kevin who like says, I see the value inside of the religion to do it all. But then there's somebody like me who's kind of dancing, you know, in the middle, uh, trying not to be lukewarm and get spit out. But all three of those levels of it can all see the same thing that's going on here and say this is trouble and this is problems i think you have a great uh, example of that through guys like james Lindsay and michael o'fallon who partner up on quite a bit of thing i mean sovereign nations is is kind of almost a sister channel to new discourses 
and uh, they do a lot together. James Lindsay, great, great podcast, like uh, Chris mentioned, uh, that you should check out. The one with uh, Benjamin Boyce on his channel today that he dropped. Between Benjamin Boyce, Crocoduck, whatever. King Crocoduck. Crocoduck. King really? Crocoduck and, and James Lindsay. All of them, you know, self-proclaimed naturalists, and I'd say all of them atheists. And uh, But the thing about it is, is they make some outstanding points and it, I you see someone made it made the joke about it you know being upside down world it was probably Jonathan Pejo but talking about how you have he did Jonathan Pejo did have a really good video on that um, that he put out probably three or four years ago talking about how you have this convergence of all these all these different types of, of people who normally were on the other side you know were opposed to each other and now are all saying kind of the same thing yeah the thing we're talking about is trying to make a convergence of all things to use more lord of the rings references it's it's making a um a, what do they call them the group that gets together a uh the fellowship the fellowship a strange fellowship of dwarfs and dwarfs and elves and humans and uh, we're all kind of seeing hey this eye of sauron thing's a problem maybe we can put down our battles here for a little yeah. bit there's a level of it too where james Lindsay or i or i've even seen brett weinstein talk about it i had a clip of it that i never got to show i've seen jeffrey miller talk about it too of saying maybe religion always was the was the box of pandora's box even if you thought none of it's true true or something like that it was a box holding in people turning their statism into religion and you do not want them turning their statism into religion in the same way you don't like cronyism you don't like you don't like the merging i mean that's one of the ideas of this the concept of this country is that those things are best left separate and, and people go well oh, religion always got blended into uh to a uh, well, there's truth of it that some of the re religious precepts came out of it, but as far as like an institutional religion getting mixed in, yeah, that's always happened too, and, and I've always been against that too. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I used to have some arguments with Mormons about it, and I'd point out to the Mormons, you don't want the state getting in charge of religion because it's not going to be Mormonism that wins. If it's the super state, the super state will stamp out Mormonism. But I, part of the deal with this is that as much as there's like a fellowship inside and outside of religion, there's also a seeping in of this stuff. It's not just outside of religion, it's inside of it too. That's a lot of what Quick's videos are and that's what Quick's so good at covering or what Michael O'Fallon is covering. Michael O'Fallon really is trying to give more warnings inside of his church than he is to the, uh, to the outside world that's just gone right down the tubes. But then James Lindsay and, and Helen Pl Pluckrose might be, be looking at liberalism as their church that got got uh, mm -hmm. infiltrated too. We had a friend of ours start trying to justify the state being an autocratic state because an autocratic state does better about safety. And he was trying to do it through the lens of some, of some LDS thinkers. Mm -hmm. And I challenged him on, I said, I don't think that's the LDS theology at all. But the next day, I think he backed off a bit is what he did, but he put up a bunch of different posts of all the different quotes on agency from prophets through the ages. And maybe he was seeing something different than I was seeing, but those, those quotes seemed pretty pro agency to me all the way through, yeah. you know, but it seemed like his initial claim was somebody trying to turn it upside down to say, blocking this person's free speech is more free speech because it allows another person to speak. There's always weird little construals like that. Mm -hmm. or the taking taking a certain uh, state mandated drug mm -hmm. is more about freedom because then we'll all be more free to go out and about and around and everything's got like this very close to the Christ antichrist in my view signal of of I think you're I think you're missing the point and you're purposely construing it and making it sound like the original point. We're going in this direction. I know we're gonna we're gonna get a little bit more into this. The church is really is is beginning to struggle. I mean, it's been struggling with wokeness and stuff like that. But um, twelfth article of faith: We believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, and magistrates in honoring and sustaining the law. I can understand with good governance. Of course, you have to understand that this was written in a time of when the United States was relatively new and the Constitution was the law, you know what I mean? But I 
worry that we're going to struggle with that. Some people might take this so literally. One of the things that I, I believe personally, I believe that God has a hierarchy with his doctrines. And when I think about it, the very, very first thing that within Mormon doctrine, the very first thing that we were given was agency. I believe that God really wants us, if you think about it in context of, of like a heavenly family, with him being the father, um, we'll include the mother too, um, just, just for those who might get upset. But, um, <laughs> you know, the thing about it is, is as, as a parent, you want your kid to grow up and make their own choices because that's what I've really always kind of pushed with my kids is that, look, I want you to make your own choices in this world. I'm not going to judge you for your choices, but uh, make good choices because because the kind of choices that you make will dictate how your life goes. And oftentimes you don't necessarily see it till later on that some of those choices can can lock you into certain certain behaviors. Can Chris and I have had had experiences going through divorce. You know what I mean? Life's just hard. It's vicious, and I believe that for the world to be good. A good place, just like Viktor Frankl talked about in *Man's Search for Meaning*. It doesn't necessarily matter what you, what I go, what happens to me, how I respond that, that matters, and that's all about agency. I think that, uh, again, here I am ranting. If the government is is cracking down and, and limiting your agency and allowing you not to be able to make the kind of choices in your life that that you feel like are are prudent for yourself, like a medical procedure. Or, or what, I believe that uh, they're overstepping their boundaries. Absolutely. I'm a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> so just the same guy posted a whole bunch of different things finally the next day about agency. And uh, if you undertake to save all, you must save them in unrighteousness and corruption. The uh, whole idea of uh, that massive panopticon city that you need to take control of all things, it's, it's, it's the most... I'd say the most beautiful theology out of Mormonism, the, the 100%. whole start of the whole entire thing was not that Satan was a bad guy trying to drag you down to hell. Satan was a guy trying to save you at force. And the agency was what set the difference. It is just the uh, most, most beautiful concept of it. And, and I think it did hold true through the prophets and, and apostles all down. They, they still held to it. And they, even, even if they sometimes put out rules themselves that were a little bit over draconian, which they backed off of or should have backed off of. But, um, the concept is, is just the perfect concept. It's a concept why I still hold some hope in, in like, we'll, we'll go back to Lord of the Rings reference. I've talked with Kevin a whole lot. I was like, there's Gandalf in the uh, Lord of the Rings and there's Gandalf the Grey and you're watching this, these wizards, these, these people who are s supposedly of religious powerful levels and you're watching them and, and there's Sauron and Gandalf and uh, Saruman and Saruman, he being one of those religious types pe people gets sucked into the, to the Sauron side. He gets sucked into the all seeing eye side because, uh, he just started buying into it too much. There's this really good video by, um, the Lotus Eaters podcast. I'll show it real fast. Ooh. Outstanding. This is the video by the Lotus Eaters podcast. And, uh, it's about Saruman and Gandalf. Is, if you've seen the whole entire thing that you have these two different things, I kind of view it as like maybe representation or analogous of the churches and Saruman buys into the thing and it's actually in the book that he starts getting a rainbow colored suit. And I just thought it was interesting to, to note that, that in the book it's, you know, I mean, well, Saruman he also got Saruman. it by reading. He got it by reading a bunch of theories. Yeah. And... So, I mean, with Saruman, I know Saruman in the, in the, in the movies is portrayed as, as the, as a white wizard. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know if that's necessarily, I'm actually, he was at first and they didn't notice until they found out that he had gone to their side. They noticed that it, they, they could finally see in his wardrobe that it had a, a ton of different, right. Different um, colors. colors, which is interesting because the combination of all the colors in light is white light. Yeah, exactly. This is one other good video on it by, uh, 
by Doug Wilson about the scouring of the Shire, maybe you don't remember unless you're somebody who reads this stuff all the time, that when the hobbits went back to the Shire, the place had become a complete police state. Mm -hmm. And that's all written in the book that they had to undo the police state of the Shire that they'd left behind, which happened because of the chaotic times that they'd left the Shire in. But then when they went to go to bed, they found that the accommodations were not what they would have expected in a place like the Shire. And sure enough, presiding over the rows of hard beds were a censorious notice and list of rules. In the upper rooms were little rows of hard beds and on every wall there was a notice and a list of rules. Pippin tore them down. The Lord of the Rings, location 1000. Later on, after the Shire had been set to rights and all the rules had been revoked, Sam was able to reduce the sheriff department to a more appropriate size. Quote, the only thing that he did as deputy mayor was to reduce the sheriffs to their proper functions and numbers. It's a good video. I recommend watching the whole entire thing or going back and reading the scouring of the Shire. You don't realize that they had to go back and undo the Jaconian world that the peaceful little Hobbitville had turned into under the chaotic times. So I just, I just realized another thing, let's say the Antichrist or the anti in the place of God, right? The panopticonic God or whatever of the war of this world, the institution of all these, these draconian rules and stuff like that. The thing that I'm realizing about it is there, there is no, for, there is no room for forgiveness. Oh yeah. If you feel like you've, you've, you're doing pretty good with all the commandments, then he comes in and in, in Matthew seven and commands you to be perfect. Which is like, okay, well, here's the thing. Not one of you guys down there is going to be able to, to keep all the commandments all the time. And when I look at the be therefore perfect, I actually think it's in, more inviting to be able to take on Christ because by his, per, his perfection is what covers you through that grace. I think that we, we've definitely brought a little bit more of the, the topic of grace into the doctrine. Um, over the last 15 years. You may not have noticed that, but uh, there is more talk of, of grace these days than, than there used to be. That's great that it's in it. Well, part of that grace that needs to be extended is the grace to an institution and whatnot. Right. And I've talked to you about this a bit too, that I view the representation of Saruman and as of Gandalf as possible institutions that might be the institutions who might stand up to the big institution, Sauron, that's trying to envelop everything, the one ring to bind them all. Look at some people, even Catholics I've seen talk about this, or even the SBC with Michael Fallon talk about their place is going full woke and they're just getting sucked up right into it and they're getting, they're, they're just becoming the thing. But in that same fight, in that book, Gandalf the Grey stands up to the Balrog and Gandalf the Grey comes back white, you know? Mm -hmm white white as as in cleaned you know cleaned off not like yeah. white as in <laughs> stupid <laughs> and but uh, um yeah the patriarchy. he came back representing the patriarchy and he came back representing the, okay he came back perfected so so in my sort of sense i say me as somebody who's outside of it who's always just kind of like waiting and reacting this is this is one of the things i say about kevin i talked a little bit about the gift of discernment in my last thing and i always struggled with the concept of gift of discernment or the, the gift certain gifts but sometimes i think some people did seem to have those gifts you know what i mean it's just it's just it's not universal because you're a bishop you have that gift or something like that well i think but, that there's you know i think that it might be more simple than we give it credit for yeah so i think that, uh, just even the ability to be able to understand the difference between right and wrong is discernment and well so i i've i've always kind of said to kevin's like i feel like i whatever that is i didn't have it. i didn't i even said it with like the midnight mormons i was on with them today that like maybe i just didn't i it's not so easy for me to like feel the spirit or see the future or that sort of stuff somebody on this other thing said well, who do you feel comfortable calling a prophet and I described, I feel comfortable calling anybody a prophet who sees a trend and stands up for it and stands against it. And they end up right, even though they face just endless amount of backlash for, for standing up and for saying the truth about something. But, it, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, what I say too, with this is like, if any one of these institutions, the SBC or whatever, or whoever, or the Mormon church that everybody's pointing out the sins of the history of the Mormon church. That's, that's all the rage in the, in the ex Mormon community. Yeah, there but, is no forgiveness, None. but I'll, I'll say something else. Like something for me is like Gandalf stood up to the eternally. 
you know. Gandalf stood up to the Balrog, and when he stood up to the Balrog, he became white, you know. And for me, I feel the same way about any institution that does it. Like, like you can say, hey, in the past it, you were gray. In the past, this stuff was weird. In the past, it was whatever. But whoever is current day going to stand up to the Balrog is the white, if that makes any sense. And it erases any grayness. The only know? and the ultimate depiction is Christ. Mm hmm. And, uh, yeah. But some of those institutions, we can, not to throw Catholic under the bus, but I mean, I think they know, my girlfriend who's a Catholic knows that her guys at the top, their suits are turning colorful, you know? Yeah. Well, the thing about it is, is that they're a good example. I think within faith, here's the thing. If you look throughout history, you can look into the, at the playbook of the devil, right? And see what happened, right? So one great way to, to get control over people is through the co-opting of, of religion is, is an outstanding way for those who, who, who are, are looking to have control in the world to be able to obtain that. And the Catholic Church is, is, is a great uh, medium. Go into, look into all the Crusades. Actually in college, one of the best courses I ever took was the history of philosophy and religion. And the one thing that my professor who was, I think he was Presbyterian, but he, he, one thought that he, he said, you know, there have been more people killed in the name of religion than anything on this, on this, in this world. But is it really religion or is it just the co-opting of religion by, by the people who see it useful? Yes. Yeah. Correct. But the thing is, is like, if you're somebody who stands, you think you stand outside and you stand in judgment of it. You're probably somebody who's fallen right down the tube of some other form of religion that you don't realize that you're just being co-opted just in the same crony way. Right. You're getting cronied. Just like religion could get cronied, you're getting antichrist. And that's like people say it'd be cringe to use to use Lord of the Rings imagery or it's cringe to even talk about religious imagery. But sometimes it's the only way to best describe it. Peterson might call archetypes. Um, but we all use literary language and 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 going back, Peterson was just recently on Joe Rogan's podcast and he tried to describe to people that we see everything through the prism of that Bible. And that's very, very just true for Western thinkers. And you don't even realize that it's there and it's, it's there in all your Marvel. It's there in all your everything. And, and you're seeing the world through it. And, and no matter how atheistic you want to try to get and pretend like you're tap dancing outside of it, you didn't get outside of it. That whole concept of cringe, which is, I would say, probably a, a form of disgust. Right. Yeah. I mean, and go look into who is it? That talk, Jonathan uh, Haidt does. Jonathan Haidt. He talks at length. He's probably one of the best guys on the planet when it comes to this, uh, to, to disgust. Your rationality. Right. You're not being right. rational. You're being emotional. But think about this. You were kind of talking about people getting cringe about, I've been noticing this. You go back and you listen to Dostoevsky. I was reading Brothers Kramazov and it's really the people in there in some respects are so very innocent and and say these things like genuine they're, they're brothers and so they're genuinely talking about how much they love each other mm -hmm. and it's like man it's, it's it's so weird because i feel like i've been i've been kind of conditioned to think that some of the things that they're saying are cringy yeah it's postmodern conditioning yeah yeah and it's but you know that going back to the what we talked about in the beginning the arts we can't cast out the arts so just because we might have this conditioning that might we might think certain things are cringy you're kind of looking looking past the mark is is the idea yeah and uh going all the way back to that art thing too the, and the uh ability to articulate ideas things that that one side of the coin of that has to get better at and the other side of the coin has to get better at not just cringing and shutting their ears off mm -hmm. to it well it's the battle that we're in right i think all those different artistic things like the lord of the rings or these different people that we've shown today talking or all the way back to the original thing just trying to depict it and articulate it which was the bible or the the book of mormon as a You've pointed a bunch of the imagery out of that sort of thing, too. It's like an articulation of the Battle of Evermore, to use another, we'll, we'll, we'll call that a, uh, a rock and roll reference instead of a Lord of the Rings reference. <laughs> but uh, that's a uh, Zeppelin. But it all matters. It's 
lame to be cynical about it. The theories that are cynical about it are lame. The critics who think they're outside of it aren't. The, the people who are pretty sure they can sniff out that the Christ and the Antichrist, even us combined, got to take a huge, huge gulp of humble, humble juice and, mm -hmm. and try to stop and figure out if we're being manipulated by the voice of Sauron, or if we're really, if we're really, uh, encountering genuine, um, genuine Christ-like love to put it as quick would put it. You know, when you read scripture and I, I could say, you could say that this, that certainly applies to, to the story of, you know, talk, the imagery of, of Saruman and, and, uh, Gandalf. It's not necessarily just that they're competing institutions. Maybe it's the same institution. Mm. Maybe, maybe you two know, people of the same institution. Correct. That's probably true. And maybe it's book. us. Yeah. Maybe it's maybe it's maybe it's inside me. The the battle between there was that uh, Solzhenitsyn battle. Good yeah, evil goes yeah. right down the middle of the heart. Yeah, Solzhenitsyn. You know, but also I can't remember who. I think it was a, a general conference talk that really kind of hit me when I was younger talking about this Native American legend of, of the chief who, and his, uh, and his grandson, he's talking to his young grandson and he's saying to his grandson that inside every man, there are two wolves, a light wolf and a dark, and a dark wolf. And they're constantly fighting. And it doesn't matter all, all through a man's life. These, these wolves are fighting. And the, and the, the young, uh, grandson looks up to his, his grandfather and says, well, which one wins? And he says, the one that you feed. Mm -hmm. And that really kind of hit me when I was young, you know, that, that, uh, oh, okay, well, I see myself doing, doing wrong things every once in a while. And uh, the thing that I've learned out in my life is that it seems like there have been so many times in my own life where I feel like I've just keep feeding that, that, uh, that dark and loathsome wolf, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then, but the funny thing is that I realized it's interesting how, how, when I feed that, uh, that light wolf inside me. I might actually feed it less, but it seems to get more power out of, out of, uh, out of less food. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting concept. I would say one of the largest parts of being an artistic thinker and artistic mind, why Kevin and I have always kind of matched up with this is, um, especially if you're writing songs, uh, or this is, this is a creative effort on top of it itself is a, a bit the ability to p pick and grab and grab and mix and match stuff that, that you don't know quite matches and that goes back to the idea of salience see what stands out to you stop and pay attention and see what stands out to you and we started this podcast i think we wrapped it all in together and made it all make sense together of these different things that we're always poking at every week and it seems to come together in the same thing of something we're thinking about that we didn't even really necessarily know from the start but I would say that any person can maybe kind of start doing that, like see the stuff that stands out to you and put it all together and see what the, see what all the different things that are poking out to your brain much together, what, what, what it says about you, what it says about the things that you're thinking. And, uh, maybe if what you're looking at is pure cynical stuff, maybe you're feeding the wrong thing. And maybe if you're looking at something that if you put it all together, it's a constructive thing or there's where some discernment comes in, dude. If you're honest with yourself, you can see what you're up to. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Are are you up to are you up to no good or are you up to are you up to doing good? Only you really know that deep down within you. And if you're honest with yourself, you got to be freaking honest with yourself. You you can sniff out and see that and discern discern your own spirit. What what are you doing? Am I doing something that's creative and positive and, and, and lifting people up? Or am I doing something that uh, that's continuing to hide and, and hide my tracks or gain advantage in certain areas? That's where yeah. I think we all have that power within us, man. It's a creative power. For sure. There's always the concept of, uh, the yin yang. There are times where you got to, to, to tear down something that's become too tyrannical or too much of a, for sure. And having the, the ability to critique and look at stuff critically is, is something that's necessary and needed when I mean, we obviously use it, especially against certain, uh, Mormon critics, <laughs> the constructive side of stuff all the way back to Roger Scruton in the beginning and, and John Verveke 
they both talk about transcendent beauty and construction and how to act in the world and how to do the right thing and how to figure out what's worth striving for. You could say on one side of the aisle, there's, they're, they're trying to do that too. And they think that, well, there's so much of those theories that I tear down. That it's actually like written so much into the theory that the way that you do it is through the destruction is through the criticizing all the way down to the, to the wick, just all the way back to Roger Scruton, especially uh, read his books. And he did a whole documentary about beauty. That's very worth watching talking about the, the value of the beautiful cities of Europe for all those years and what's the name of that? You know, one thing that happened when we were talking about the whole constructivism and then looking, we've talked about deconstruction, deconstruction over the last couple of videos and stuff. Look at no, the Cathedral of, of Notre Dame. It's been one of the most, one of the, one of the most beautiful structures and pieces of architecture that, that man has ever created. And just like that, it was burned down. Yep. It's called Why Beauty Matters by Roger Scruton, and it's a BBC documentary, so I shouldn't show any of it here. It'll get immediately gets taken down because I guess they're hyper, hyper picky. Well, I think we wrapped it all in together, but uh, just back to, because strangely enough, the even though we started on Scruton, went into beauty and, and went into salience and went into discernment and all that stuff, I appreciate actually that we actually went into constructive ideas because this whole concept came out of that panopticon concept, which actually comes out of... Michel Foucault, who took it from Jeremy Bentham, but it's one of the ideas that was a pretty decent idea by, by that guy. Not to end on like a, a sour note, but that Pinocchio thing that Peterson always talks about, the uh, Pleasure Island stuff and turning it into donkeys and, and it makes you ready to become a slave and get put into the panopticon. I mean, it really is real. We all really need to watch the things that were given up, the cultural revolution that we're being put through. And, and for what? How, and for what? It's Chesterton fence. It's, but also remember too that it's it's a, not a not a sour note because guess what? There's there is a way out of that pleasure that pleasure island, you know. Yeah, well, Mar Marshall McLuhan the same theory that says that, that all the medium will become the beast and will get inside the belly of it. He also say there's right. talks about how there's a way out of it in that same video that I showed earlier. But it's it's always worth remembering that the cynicism and the uh, critique. Uh, of the Jacobins ended up in Napoleon, uh, the Bolsheviks ended up in Stalin, <laughs> Mao even went after, he kind of split up in the same exact way, the party before him, I think it's called like a KVT or something like that, and then he did a full-on cultural revolution, and one of the main things they did in all that was destruct all the beauty, destruct, rip away, yoink away all the religion, yep. and if you're religious or not, you should have all your alarm bells going on right now right. and some of us atheists need to understand that we've played some part in that whole entire thing too the, the just carelessly yoinking away and ripping away stuff and thinking that it's the other side of its utopia or pleasure island it's well the gotta, funny thing is that i i think that yeah but don't don't underestimate that the, the believing side isn't going to be just as is instrumental because i'm worried now i kind of see it more almost as like a lot of Absolutely. a lot of atheists want to let me give the devil his due is with uh, a lot of these atheists are kind of realizing oh crap we've we've cracked the dam and then and the thing about it is is i think sometimes you know that we got to be careful those who have uh, who are on the believing side to 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 not follow suit because i think that that's happening right now oh totally it's like, part of it's pressure part of it's that that peer pressure of but lady here's gaga the, said it so <laughs> You know. Here's the thing. Follow that whole thought on Pinocchio. If you look at the Jungian archetype in there, the thing that saves it all is 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 the rescuing of the father, which is which is often depicted as culture. That's the thing. Solzhenitsyn did right to to enslave a nation. You must first sever their roots. And so, when it comes to Gramsci's the concept, whole theories about too, but the concept of like talked about cringe we talked about disgust these are tools we we become so desensitized through our our media that we want to cast the baby out with the bathwater there are a lot of studies that are done about you tend to prefer the taste of of artificial flavoring when you've when that's all you've you've had to to natural flavoring and i think that that that's a lot of what's been going on with with us we we've, we've lost touch with the arts we've lost touch with uh and we've become ashamed of who we are. 
And, and the thing about it is, is the thing that I appreciate about God is that he lets you take your adventure. In fact, he, I think he encourages it. I watched a really gr good video. I, I, I wish I remembered where it was, but talking about uh, the parable of the prodigal son. And it was talking about how all three characters in, in the prodigal son are all us. Hmm. You'll be the one going away, pissing away your, your inheritance and that kind of thing. But then you'll also end up becoming the father too mm -hmm. and welcoming, your, wel uh, welcoming back to the fold. But you also got to be careful about being the brother who's always been there and not having, having that resentment. Mm -hmm. So it's so deep, man. When you start thinking about that, holy crap, that's like, that's, that's me, you know? But uh, the thing about it is we're, we're, we're pumping ourselves with artificial flavoring all the time. Everything's watered down. Chris and I have always been critical of, of music, manufactured music, which is what a good majority of the people listen to these days. Um, but even it's even hard for, I think, us as musicians sometimes to see that, that everything's been done. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's where we kind of get a little bit... Uh, and it can be done easily just over a computer now instead, right. of, instead of learning a craft and but that's not amazing. true but mm -hmm. it's not true that's that i think that's a lie i think that that's a lie within within our time that we have to that we have to grapple with well i don't know if it's worth getting into now because i mean it, we're, we're probably getting near wrapping up but i, I mentioned when talking about this the, some concepts that i've i've noticed inside of poker and inside of basketball mm -hmm. and the uh, the poker the poker concept I I'm somebody I played I played a bunch of poker I used to live in Vegas and you and uh, I got yeah, I got pretty good at it I have uh, I have pictures of winnings to show it but something happened with poker in that it got it got game theoried out it got AI'd out mm -hmm. it got so it's got so artificial intelligence out that there's there's now these charts these types of game theories um, they call it range play that supposedly you can learn and know exactly what you're supposed to do in every situation no matter what in the game if you just memorize it all largely that they're just right moves and there's no more of the old uh, legend of the guy who bluffs and reads and, and does all this sort of stuff it's all just game theoried out through like ai probability stuff and the same thing sort of happened in the nba that like through like money ball type studies they found out that like the three-pointer really is heavily weighted and, and these people should just start jacking up three-pointers and all that sorts of stuff and there's this level of, of like hey we figured it out we figured out how to to win the basketball games make the most points in the basketball games we figured out how to make the poker win all that sorts of stuff in the middle of that you lost all the story <laughs> you know you lost entirely the whole, like think of how many songs and movies and legends and things are about poker. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mark Twain said, uh, learning how to play two pairs is valuable as a college education. And, and I can think of a Leonard Cohen song and, and well, I mean, we all know the, uh, no one hold them, no one fold them type stuff. And the, the endless amounts of, uh, the, the movies like Legend of Buster Scruggs or Maverick or any James Bond movie or any sort of thing like that. And in the basketball world, the same thing happened. The popularity of the sport's going down, and a lot of people say it's partially because it's gone woke corporate too, but it's also because people just run up and down the court and jack threes up. And that's actually the right mode to be, to just win. We figured out from computer modeling and stuff like that. But but the game was better when we had we had coaches who said, no, you got to get in there and you got to push in and you gotta, all got to do this play and you all got to do this dance and you all got to do this maneuver to get in towards the hoop. And more people watched the game for it. Peterson talks often about is the point to win the game or is the point to keep up the iterations of the game, you know, like to have it iterate into right. infinity. Mm -hmm. And there's so much about this artificial intelligence stuff beyond just the, uh, the panopticon and all that stuff that it's just going to figure out and do everything for you. It's going to do all your songs for you. It's going to win all your poker for you. It's going to tell you how to, to most easily win the basketball game until the end of time. Their story getting lost in the middle of all that too. You know, there's art. The art is getting lost in it. But once again, just like you said, but no, it isn't. <laughs> like it's still there. Yeah. Like the things that matter and the things that are done right and the things that are interesting, the things that make people stop and say, that's beautiful or that's amazing how those people did that or how those people played in that way. That's still there and it's still going to 
I think, win out or maybe through some sort of cycle of pride or something, get, get knocked back to that or who knows what. And the whole world of having our everything figured out for us and all our safety figured out for us and all the morals figured out for us, it's just not going to work. Yep. And uh, the problem of it is, is getting to the other side of it or getting out of it like Marshall McLuhan says if we go all into the belly of the beast how do you get out and and there's some discussion in that podcast of the way we get out is by all banding together or James Lindsay recently recommended this thing on the on the the human colossus um I'd have to look it up maybe I'll link it to the bottom um uh, about just all these humans are gonna have to form together to band up against this uh, Sauron like figure of this thing that has all things figured out for us what Mormon theology I think would have called Satan or, or an Antichrist, you know, and uh, the idea that it's all just done for you. Yeah. And uh, all the story's gone. That's Satan. Yep. That it's not Christ. Uh, coming from a non religious ex believer, whatever. Right. Sure. So. It's interesting. You kind of mentioned sports and, and whatnot, and um, I, I can think of everything. We've talked about music, we've talked about culture, we've talked about sports, and how um, it's interesting because I'm I'm so much. I'm a hockey player, and uh, I played hockey, hockey in high school. Um, my my son now is uh, is playing in high school, and uh, to watch him play. Like, I, I don't really have a whole lot of interest. I mean, I, I love going to a Grizzlies game or whatever. Or, um, love to go, actually, to an NHL game. But I, I really love watching my son play. And, and, and seeing him seeing him get better. And I think that that is the whole thing. Like you said, you know, with Peterson talking about, it's the, it's the set and iteration of games. I have one son, one son playing basketball. I have one son playing hockey. This was um, my my older son's last hockey game for the season. Saturday, we started off with my son, my younger son's basketball game, and he lost. He was so mad. He was so angry and upset with himself. And then my my older son lost his hockey game. The very last game of the season. I, I played on a league this this last in the fall, and we went the whole season completely defeated. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, isn't that because some of your best guys got sat down for saying bad words? Or well, no, there was one one kid who got kicked out for mouthing off. But uh, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the biggest thing was actually that there was like a number of. A number of players that just weren't committed and mm -hmm. i remember going through this season let me tell you something when when you only have eight players to play a, a hockey game it's hard because you're constantly playing you know what mm -hmm. i mean you're, you're basically skating for that your heart out for for 45 minutes with not much break and i remember there was like several moments where i was like um i, I don't want to go to this game it's freaking 10 30 at night and i know that a whole bunch of my teammates aren't going to make it but mm. I, I remember just like telling myself i'm what i committed i committed to this game i committed to this team and i'm not going to freaking let my team down i'm going to make every single game even if i'm the only person that freaking makes it and we ended up going the whole freaking season 100 percent defeated i remember when i was in high school my my uh my junior year or no no my senior year we actually went the full season uh, undefeated. Um, we only lost to one freaking team, freaking Fremont High School. In um, We lost to them twice, you know, double elimination finals. We took second in state that year, Murray High, uh, 1997. But uh, we went the full regular season 100% undefeated. We had an outstanding team. And... Uh, you know, I've kind of sat and thought about it. I was like, you know, I've I've gone a full I've gone a full season undefeated, and I've gone a full season completely defeated now. And the thing about it is, is there's there's so much value in losing a game. Mm. 
In fact, I think that there's more value in losing a game than there is in winning one. Mm -hmm. And I, I watched with my sons. I, I watched, my youngest son, he, he was so angry with himself. And I was like, well, look, it's making you want to be better, right? This loss. So we went out and bought him some new Nikes. He was pretty stoked about that. Watching your kids grow up and, and try something new and get good at something. There's where the life is. There's where the life is in, in sports and in and teach your teach your kid to play poker. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> the whole part of a the way you really win a poker if you're gonna play it in not that AI way is by telling a story or yep. figuring out other people's stories that they're trying yeah. to tell at the table. Right. Yep. You know. So it is it is um it is about stories but um i like that too i like i think there's more to learn in losing i we grew up in salt lake when we were seniors in high school the jazz went two years the utah jazz went two years in a row taking second place and i always took so much um, pride in the honor that john stockton and carl malone did that with john stockton's been in the news lately too of standing up for his own agencies and freedoms and the guy's still just an internal hero for me and uh, um, the way that they said, yeah, it was in just how much we just worked and worked and worked at it with integrity and it didn't matter. And, and myself, all those years later when I did, a, when I got into the bodybuilding and competed the highest level I got, I took second place twice. And in my mind and in, in that connecting the dots way, I, I just kind of likened it to the jazz. It's like, yeah, I, I, I did just what they did. I did my best, I did my dang best and I, I put it all on the table and, and I got pretty close, but I didn't get it. But the journey was what mattered and there's some sort of level where I'm happy. Like I'm happy. It was just second place. Sometimes second from. place is the best place to be, man, because, because it's, it's the most human place, man. Yeah. You know, it's like, um, like to be like, you look at like, you know, how, how, is there any chance that I could ever become like, uh, I don't know the best at anything. You know what I mean? Probably not at this point. But I, I kind of, I'm fine with that, actually. Like, I guess the the best thing that I can be in my own life is try to be the best dad, try to be the best husband I can, and try to try to be the best self I can to, to my own self, you know what I mean? That's why I think Peterson's doing, has gotten so, so big, is because he's actually helping people to get right with themselves. Yeah, I could put it at like a level too. So all you can do is try your best and be your best, and, and then like magical things happen in the middle. Like go, going through that whole process, I met people and was able to do things and inspire things and, and that sort of stuff. But like myself, I, I have, I think I can become the best flat picker at the guitar in Utah. <laughs> you know, like that, that, that's a, you always got to like put the, uh, the brackets around the thing <laughs> like like i mean i was i almost took second place in utah you can try to be the best in within a within a realm yeah. or something like that right. uh there's some flat pickers in in uh, north carolina and and uh tennessee and in that area i'm never gonna be as good at but i think for like a region or something i could maybe do it and so i go for it and i just try to do it and i say that's that's even what i'm gonna do and i work at it almost every single day and it's that thing that's in uh, old brother where art that was like the treasure that you seek you'll find your treasure even though it wasn't the treasure that you seek that you saw right. in doing that you know what i mean and and i don't even, whenever i endeavor to do that some sort of thing like that i put a goal at the end of it like that and i'm almost kind of pretty sure that like whatever that that goal's not gonna hit nobody's ever gonna say here's your medal you were the best flat picker in utah <laughs> but but something else will come hey, from, I know you. from the effort <laughs> Aren't you the best flat picker in Utah? <laughs> Can I get your autograph? And I don't even know who's here. I mean, some guy from North Carolina or something might have just showed up here and, and it's already too late. But but uh, that's not the point. You, you go for the goal of the thing and uh, in the journey is where you find the stuff. You know? Yeah. Well, I wanted to, you know, I mean, I've done... The weird thing for me is now is I don't I don't necessarily know what I want to do anymore, you know what I mean? Because I did the things that I wanted to do. I played in a good band, you know. I um, I don't know. That was a big thing for me, you know. Um, sometimes I wish I would have got a little bit farther, like we were the cutting out. Let's become the best podcasters in the yeah. uh, 
both in Mormon the, and ex-Mormon. I think we probably are. There's nobody who's the ex-Mormon and Mormon talking together. So we already, we already narrowed the category down enough to. Right. But uh, we could do it. It's for sure. Right on, man. Anything else? Yeah, I wanted to 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 leave with a leave on a cringy moment, um, if I may. Um, hopefully, you know, if you've made it this far, don't. Uh, you know, try to take it for what it's worth. On my mission, I list. I remember listening to a John By the Way talk. I know John By the Way. Do you really? John By the Way took me to a BYU football game when I was like seven. Really? My my friend in high school is his uncle. He had the same last name, oh, okay. and uh, he took me and him to a BYU football game. Yeah, I yeah. remember there was By the Ways at our school. Yep, our but, grade. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, when I was out on my mission, he had this good talk that I don't know the name of it, but he talked about the concept of being kind of like someone who, who uplifts and, and, and raises people up and does good things in the world. And I, I felt I, I felt I had to repent because I had, I had been kind of a turd in high school to some people and whatnot. And um, I'd been, I'd been, I had been bullied and I'd, I had bullied other people. I'd actually bullied people one kid that was twice my size and then he socked me in the eye you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah who is that i'll cut it out i think is that i i needed to get socked in the eye so i could learn a lesson but anyway i'm, I'm digressing but uh by the way I gave this this talk and um in that talk he recited this poem that i memorized when i was out on my mission and uh i guess this is where the conservative Part of my uh, my nature comes out is is uh, in in uh, as I've kind of mentioned in, in past uh, episodes is that uh, being a builder, you know, you're 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 set within certain constraints to build a, build a good building or or a good structure that's going to be sound and and uh, and that kind of thing. But I'm gonna I'm gonna share this this poem with you. Hopefully I don't screw it up because I haven't said it for so many years, but. Um, it goes like this. I passed one day through a lonely town and saw men tearing a building down. With a ho heave ho and a husky yell, they swung a beam and a side sidewall fell. I asked the foreman, are these men skilled, the kind you'd hire if you wanted to build? Oh no, he chuckled, no indeed, common labor is all I need. Why, I can easily wreck in a day or two what men have taken weeks to do. I thought to myself as I went on my way, which of these roles have I tried to play? Am I a builder who works with care, measuring life by rule and square? Am I shaping my work to a well-made plan, patiently doing the best I can? Or am I a wrecker who walks into town, content with the labor of tearing down? Good. Thanks, John, by the way. <laughs>